does climate change and chocolate cake have in common? <laughs> well, a chocolate cake is rich, luxurious, addictive, and it has a high calorie intake. Climate change has a high carbon load, and it's caused primarily by countries that have emitted a lot. These are rich countries that are addicted to their luxurious lifestyles. But this cake is going to shrink, and it has to be shared by you and me if we want to solve the climate change problem. Or we have to make a low calorie carbon cake. Now you're probably wondering, who is she and why does she want to talk about climate change? Well, I grew up in India, I studied there, and I won a scholarship to Harvard Law School, and then I worked for the last 25 years in the Netherlands, because I fell in love with a Dutch man, uh, on climate change. And then I became professor of climate change policy and law at the Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam, and I also had a professorship at UNESCO in Delft, UNESCO IH Institute for Water Education on water. So I've been studying this stuff for a long time, and I thought, how do I make this information available to people? So let me try and explain it a little bit. I'm going to argue three things today. The first thing is that the climate conflict is growing as the carbon cake is shrinking. I'm also going to argue that the global climate leadership contract is cracking. But nevertheless, we are slowly learning to share this cake. Now, if we want to solve this problem, you and I, we all have to get engaged. And at the same time, we also have to accept the rule of law. Now, climate change, basically, it leads to rising sea levels, rising temperatures, changing rainfall patterns, and extreme weather events. No one can escape its impacts. Even our ecosystems will suffer, and in turn, it will cause us to suffer. So if you want to solve the climate change problem, basically what we have to do is we have to try to stabilize our greenhouse gas concentrations. And that means that we have to reduce our emissions. Now imagine, that what we emit every year can be depicted as a cake, then this means that the cake is shrinking every year until it disappears. This is the cake of annual permissible carbon emissions. And it is this cake that we have to share between all of us. And this makes it a north-south problem. The rich North has had larger slices of cake in the past. Past emissions cause current impacts. And the rich are better able to deal with impacts than the poor. Over the last 20 years, what we see is that the cake is shrinking and the conflict is growing worldwide. We are running out of time to solve this problem. But optimists say, no, there's no reason to think that the cake is shrinking. We can make the cake grow. And this can be done if we invest in technology. Technology into uh, renewable energy, wind or solar, or we go in for um, emission savings, energy savings, conservation, double glass windows, for example, methane-free agriculture, less wet rice production perhaps, less meat. So we could rely also on adaptation. Well, if it's so easy to make the cake grow, why aren't we doing it? The reason we are not doing it is because of vested interests. These interests are those people who have invested so much in our energy infrastructure today that they don't want to see any change. They want to convince you and me that the climate problem does not exist or that if it exists, there's no solution. And of course, for you and me, well, our jobs, our travels, all lead to greenhouse gas emissions. 
our exotic foods and drinks also. Besides, reducing emissions sounds a little bit like rationing, like limits to growth, like communism. It's much easier to think that the scientists have got it all wrong or that somebody else far away will get affected by the impacts of climate change or perhaps that the weather event is an act of God. But the bottom line is the problem is here and we have to learn to share the cake. And the question is then who reduces his share of cake and who gets an increase? And this is going to be the North-South problem for a long time to come. And no one, neither the rich nor the poor, want to actually reduce their slice of cake. And that is the reason why the global climate leadership contract is cracking. Let me explain. On the x-axis, you see income. On the y-axis, you see pollution or emissions. As a country becomes richer, it pollutes more. And after a while, it pollutes less. Well, the developing countries said, we are on the left side of the curve. We can't grow without polluting. In 1990, the rich countries thought they were on the right side of the curve. And that meant that they could grow without polluting. So the solution was, the North leads it reduces its emissions. The South follows. And then the North makes space for the South to follow, which means the North takes a small piece of cake and the South gets a bigger piece of cake. And the North was going to give technology and finance to the South, and the South was going to take a shortcut, leapfrog to development. What a perfect solution. And this was the leadership paradigm that was the basis of the Climate Change Convention in 1992. The North leads by reducing its emissions and the South follows and together we solve the world's problems. And that was because we all believed in the upside down U-curve. That was then. By 1997, things had changed. The US was now saying, we are not going to ratify any new Kyoto Protocol unless key southern countries adopt meaningful action. And the South said, why us? We are supposed to follow. And the European Union said, well, we are not going to ratify any Kyoto Protocol until the US does it. So everyone was waiting for everyone else. And no one wanted to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, which actually gave you slices of cake for rich countries. It defined the exact amount that a country could emit. And this is because by then no one is believing in the upside down U-curve. Now we realize that as we become richer, we pollute more. And after a while, there's no real automatic incentive to start to invest in uh, green technologies. So emissions increase. And the worst part is, if the South follows in the footsteps of the North, then they will both keep increasing their emissions. And the problem will never be solved. Both will want more cake. Anyway, in 2001, the United States decided to walk out of the climate negotiations in the Kyoto Protocol. Well, the moment they walked out, the rest of the world came together and quickly ratified the Kyoto Protocol so it would enter into force. Now, the US is feeling isolated. So it then began to negotiate all kinds of agreements with other countries on climate-related issues. By 2008, recession sets in. Rich countries are now preoccupied with rescuing the banks and creating jobs. By 2011, many poor countries are becoming quite rich. They now say, okay, we will take on carbon targets, but only if the rich countries help us. And the rich countries said, we will take on carbon targets if all other countries, including the US, do so. And the US, well, it was stuck. The US Senate was not willing to commit to far-reaching targets. 
So global climate politics became captive to the politics of the US Senate. Everyone was now waiting for the US Senate. And then the domino effect started. Following the US, Canada, then Russia, Japan, New Zealand, all said that they would no longer accept targets for this decade. The European Union is now the only leader left. Ladies and gentlemen, the global climate leadership contract is cracking. And now the only hope lies with the South. If the emerging economies can modernize without westernizing, then maybe, maybe they can find the values and the technologies to take us to a carbon-free world. Maybe. Well, does all this mean, this short history mean, that the global governance system is failing? No, of course not. For never in the history of humankind have we had a problem quite so complex as this, which involves each and every one of us. So the global system is actually learning. In the first 10 years, we understood the nature of the problem, the causes, the effects. We learned to improve our routines. In the second decade, we began to question some of our assumptions. We added, for example, forests into our solution. But in the third decade, we have realized that it's no point just tinkering with the system at the margin. We have to revisit our production and consumption patterns. We have to change our lifestyles. We have to restructure society. So, the global governance system is not in a deadlock. It's taking some time off to let us all revisit our lives and see how we can possibly change and overhaul our system. And of course, an overhaul of the system means you and me. Climate change is not just a problem of governments, it's a problem of people. Both you and me have to eat less carbon cake. We have to all go on a diet. And apart from that, even if you and I were to decide to do that, the problem is our governments. Many of our politicians are just not willing to think beyond the short term, to think beyond the short term economics and politics. We probably need leaders of the stature of Gandhi and Nelson Mandela, leaders who can help us reconcile our economic aspirations with our environmental limitations. We need to live in harmony with nature. But there's another way to get governments behave themselves. And that is perhaps by arguing for the rule of law or constitutionalism. Let me explain. The rule of law or constitutionalism means that all of us worldwide decide that we are going to agree on certain basic principles of and the environment, but also that we will decide on human rights issues, economic and social rights and responsibilities. And once we've decided that for all of us on this earth, then we decide how to share the cake inside this framework. It's within this framework that states get the space to behave in a certain manner. This is the only way to ensure that no one and no country sees itself as above the law, not even the US. In fact, Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, he said at one point, at the international level, all states strong and weak, big and small, need a framework of fair rules, which each can be confident that others will obey. Those who seek to bestow legitimacy must themselves embody it, and those who invoke international law must themselves submit to it. So, this is the idea, rule of law, constitutionalism. 
how do we make such an idea a reality? We need public support. Already we find that the European Union and the Global South are calling for the rule of law at international level. You and me, we probably also agree that there's need for rule of law at the national level. Then why not at the international level? We thus need a social movement that demands constitutionalism at the global level, that makes our governments accountable not only to us, but to the global community. So ladies and gentlemen, join the social movement for global constitutionalism. Engage in dialogue about it. Make it something discussable. Be part of the global consciousness on constitutionalism. For no country and no one must be above the law. After all, we share one earth and we have one carbon cake to share amongst us all. I would like to end <laughs> by quoting Leonard Cohen. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light comes in. Thank you.